Welcome to What China's Strategic Breakout Means for the U.S. Please welcome Patty Jane Geller, Senior Policy Analyst in the Heritage Foundation's Center for National Defense. All right, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this event on what China's strategic breakout means for the U.S. Last summer, satellite imagery revealed to the public that China is building hundreds of new missile silos in its western desert as part of what U.S. STRATCOM Commander Admiral Richard has labeled a strategic breakout. According to DOD, China is on track to have about 1,000 nuclear warheads by the end of this decade, although we shouldn't assume that it will stop there. China is also improving its nuclear arsenal qualitatively having rounded out its nuclear triad with a new bomber and even testing novel capabilities like a fractional orbital bombardment system. As a result, the U.S. must now deter two peer nuclear armed competitors at the same time, which is unprecedented for U.S. history. So what does this all mean for the U.S.? How dangerous is China's nuclear expansion and what do we need to do about it? So fortunately, today we have a top-notch panel here who will help us address those questions. Uh, so I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists, starting with Dr. Toshi Yoshihara. Dr. Yoshihara is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. He's taught at the U.S. Naval War College, Tufts University, and now at Georgetown. I've been able to learn a great deal from him on China's military strategy. And next we have Dr. Brad Roberts. Dr. Roberts is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy a role in which he served from 2009 to 2013. As it was during that time period when many decisions about our current nuclear force structure were made, he brings an important perspective to our panel. He currently directs the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And then finally, we have the Honorable Frank Miller. Mr. Miller has served in several government roles over a 31-year period of, of service, including a Senior Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control in the National Security Council under President Bush. Today, he's a principal at the Skokoff Group, and he brings us a wealth of knowledge in nuclear deterrence policy. So we're going to start with opening remarks from each of our panelists and then move into a period of Q&A. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can submit them during the event uh, on your screen. So with that, uh, Toshi, I'm going to hand it over to you to please start us off. Thank you uh, very much for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here to share some of my thoughts about China's nuclear modernization. Um, I just wanted to note, firstly, uh, the, the change in tone in discussions about Chinese nuclear modernization. And we've been seeing this uh, change uh, on the pages of foreign affairs, or on the rocks, the Atlantic, and elsewhere. And having watched the debate over the years, I think this, this shift was kind of jarring, particularly some of the discussions that have taken place over the past year or so. So for more than a decade, uh, the discourse about China's nuclear modernization was relatively static. The consensus or mainstream view was that China would stick to a minimalist posture, that China would stick uh, to its no first use policy, that it would pursue uh, assured retaliation, which was the ability to inflict unacceptable damage after China is attacked with nuclear weapons, that its forces would perform basically one function or one mission, which is the nuclear counterattack or the nuclear counter strike operation, which is the ability to survive a nuclear strike and have the adequate number of delivery systems that can penetrate enemy defenses to reach their intended targets, that China would maintain a lean and effective force, uh, basically focusing on a quantitatively limited force uh, with an emphasis on qualitative improvements to ensure assured retaliation. And China's current inventory of nuclear forces would seem to bear this out. Uh, it maintains a relatively small uh, force and is often seen as a minimum deterrent. Uh, according to one estimate, Beijing has about 350 warheads, mostly uh, launched by its land and sea-based uh, missiles. Let me just say a few words then about China's nuclear modernization. What we've seen uh, over the past few years is that China has been bolstering its uh, strategic deterrent that portend more change, perhaps uh, fairly radical change. China is fielding a new world mobile ICBM capable of carrying multiple warheads. It's working on a follow-on strategic ballistic missile submarine and a new uh, submarine launched missile. It's fielded a nuclear capable bomber uh, as was mentioned, forming a nascent triad, and it's 
forming a new strategic bomber and a nuclear capable air launched missile. Um, it also has a family of theater nuclear strike capabilities, including the dual use DF-26 intermediate range missile, which is considered the first uh, nuclear capable precision strike missile that could deliver a lower yield warhead. Other theater strike systems include the DF-21 medium range missile and possibly the DF-17 hypersonic glide vehicle. It's worth noting here that the PLA rocket force has increased the number of launchers and missiles for its theater strike systems, particularly the DF-26 missiles quite rapidly over a relatively short period of time. We now know through um, open source intelligence, as uh, Patty Jane mentioned, uh, that has revealed that Beijing has been building hundreds of new ICBM silos. Patty Jane also mentioned that China has successfully tested uh, the FOBs armed with a uh, hypersonic glide vehicle, which can avoid early detection, evade defenses, and hit precisely. The Department of Defense projects that Beijing could have 700 deliverable warheads by 2027 and possibly more than 1,000 by 2030. Uh, so it's clear that the future size and composition of China's nuclear arsenal could change quite a bit. The most recent national security strategy states that both uh, Russia and China uh, will be fielding modern and diverse global and regional nuclear forces. The national defense strategy also talks about China obtaining a larger and more diverse arsenal that could be designed to distract and divide the United States and its allies. And the most recent nuclear posture review uh, talks about the fact that China may have more nuclear options, uh, including strategies for nuclear coercion and limited nuclear first use. So this isn't just about changes in the size and composition of China's nuclear arsenal, but also uh, leads us to rethink how China might use or threaten to use its nuclear forces. Uh, let me just say a few words about some of the drivers and sources of China's nuclear modernization. I think one set of drivers are really um, aligned with China's reactions to external st stimuli, and most of these are focused on the United States. Uh, China is trying to reduce the vulnerability of its forces to U.S. conventional precision strike systems that could ultimately threaten the Chinese nuclear deterrent. This has led to years-long debate about uh, conditioning China's no-first-use policy. Uh, China is also trying to reduce vulnerability to U.S. missile defenses. Uh, Chinese reaction or overreaction to the deployment of that in South Korea a few years ago uh, sort of um, highlights uh, this concern. China could potentially be responding to emerging geometries of defense, uh, deterrence, I mean, including India's nuclear, emerging nuclear posture. But I also think that it's worth thinking about another set of drivers that would lend more agency to China itself. And I think the primary one here is uh, Xi Jinping's ambitions for a world-class military under the slogan of a strong military dream. And uh, what that dream consists of potentially means that uh, China might want to pursue nuclear capabilities that are commensurate with China's uh, great power status. Uh, China's nuclear modernization, of course, would also enhance mutual vulnerability with the United States. On the surface, this may be stabilizing, but it, but it would also keep the United States at bay by deterring it from making nuclear threats against China in a local crisis or war. This would also increase Chinese confidence about using force conventionally to achieve local aims with less fear of American nuclear coercion. Uh, this modernization could also potentially enhance China's ability to challenge or threaten U.S. extended deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. I'm thinking here primarily in terms of uh, China's theater nuclear arsenal uh, and the asymmetry that that introduces into the nuclear balance. Uh, and finally, I think it's worth keeping an eye on lessons that the PLA and the Chinese leadership may have learned uh, from the war in Ukraine. Uh, that might reinforce existing doctrinal preferences when it comes to nuclear matters. Uh, I have some additional thoughts about U.S. extended deterrence in the region, as well as lessons learned from Ukraine, uh, but I will hold that off for the time being for the follow-on Q&A, and I'll leave my remarks here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'll hand it off to Dr. Roberts for your opening remarks, please. Patty Jane, thank you. Let me suggest a slight re change in the order, have Frank go next. I've been set upon by a fleet of uh, leaf blowers uh, and they, they will pass quickly, but at the moment I can't hear very much. So I'll, I'll take up the task next, thank you. 
Okay, well, uh, I will take the baton from, from Brad. And, and Patty Jane, thank you for inviting me. And Toshi and, and Brad, good to be on the panel with you. I want to take a step back uh, as we look at China's strategic breakout, and what it means for the United States, um, and look at the world over the last 10 years. And, and a bit off axis, I mean, first, we just need to remark about Russia. We take a step back and say the Russian military buildup um, has been fairly impressive, although their, its performance in the field has been less impressive over the last 10 years, the conventional buildup and indeed the nuclear buildup. The second thing is that the Russian government has been making nuclear threats against its neighbors since the early 2010s. It's just that everyone either forgot or didn't pay attention. But the nuclear threats have been part of Russia's uh, diplomatic uh, coercion strategy um, for, for quite some time. Third, the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014, the invasion of Ukraine in February, and the great instability this is creating in, in one part of the world where we have vital interests engaged. We move across the world to China, and we talk about the, the significant buildup of Chinese conventional and nuclear forces, a highly impressive kit. We haven't seen uh, Chinese forces tested. In fact, they may be as, as poorly uh, uh, performing in, in battle as the Russian forces have been, have, have been, but that's something we really don't want to find out. But we couple the Chinese buildup with, with China's aggressive activities, the artificial islands, which they pledged never to militarize and have been militarizing ever since, the claims, uh, territorial claims to the South China Sea, the harassment of, of U.S. naval and air forces throughout the Pacific, uh, the, the um, activities in and around the Senkakus. Um, so you, you, you see a, a buildup of military force, and then you see aggressive activities backed up by that military force. Uh, we then move to the nuclear forces themselves, um, a nuclear force which is well beyond what is necessary to deter the United States, Russia, and, and even India. And the big question is why, and as I think Toshi touched on, we're no longer looking at a force designed to back up a strategy of no first use and minimum deterrence. So what is the big question for us is what is the aim of, of this Chinese nuclear buildup at all levels, medium range and short range and intercontinental range? Um, just this week, uh, Xi Jinping is telling his armed forces, you need to prepare for war. That's a pretty chilling statement. So, so taken together, Russia and China, but particularly what's going on with China, we face the question, what does it mean for the United States? The first thing I think it means is that we need a nuclear strategic force which is designed to deter two nuclear peer potential enemies. And in, in my judgment, and I've said this before, uh, the, the 1550 of New START uh, will not be sufficient in a couple of years. It, it's barely sufficient today. So the first thing is to recognize that our nuclear force levels designed for 2010 are not sufficient for 2024, 2025. Secondly, as a matter of policy, we need to understand that we, we must be thinking about deterring Russia and China simultaneously, not sequentially. But on this point, the Biden administration's thinking is extremely muddled. The nuclear posture review raises the question but it doesn't answer it. And I have a couple of quotes that, that are really troubling. In late October, a senior defense official who was speaking uh, uh, anonymously said the following right after the NPR came out, quote, I don't want to suggest that this is a solved or a closed problem and that we now have the answers. This is new territory for us, speaking of the two nuclear peer adversaries. How do you successfully fight one adversary while having enough in reserve to hold the other at bay. And just the second part of that cannot be a solution, where if China has 1,000 nuclear warheads and Russia has 1,000, then we will need 2,000, because that's an arms race nobody should want to be in. And so this completely muddles the whole issue. First, it suggests a win-hold strategy as opposed to a simultaneous strategy. Second, the number of warheads is that Russia and China deploy is incidental. The question is, can we cover the targets that the Russian and Chinese leaderships hold most dear? And the third point 
bringing in a question of an arms race is 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 almost laughable and embarrassing since it's Russia and China that have been modernizing their forces for the past decade and we haven't even put a new system in the field yet. Then yesterday, yesterday, uh, Colin Call, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, said to reporters, "We should expect the Russia-China relationship to deepen." Nine months ago, Xi Jinping and Putin signed off on their so-called No Limit Strategic Partnership. Quote. They've really been much more willing to signal this thing as edging towards an alliance as opposed to a superficial partnership, Call said. So is it, you know, if it's an alliance and we're saying that at a policy level, we need to be talking about a simultaneous deterrence strategy, not one which is sequential. All of this says we need to go beyond 1550. Is that sufficient? No. We need to have a sense of urgency, particularly given the kinds of things that Xi Jinping is saying. For example, on the conventional side, we need to massively build up our stocks of war reserve munitions, which are lacking. We need to do a great deal more to provide missile defense for Guam. We need to speed the deployment of the conventional prompt strike system into the Pacific. We need as a diplomatic imperative to counter the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative all around the globe, because this is a part of the vital global competition. And finally, I think we need to expand the AUKUS relationship, all well and good, a terrific initiative, but we need to bring in, in certain ways and in certain other uh, uh, places, not building nuclear submarines, Japan and South Korea, so that we have a Pacific capability to deter China in the theater and to deter Russia in the theater and to deter North Korea in the theater. So, again, the nuclear force levels are sine qua non, but more has to be done. And I think I'll stop here. I've, as uh, as Toshi said, I, I have more thoughts, but I'll save those. And I will hope that Brad's leaf blowers have gone away. <laughs> well, they've migrated a, a little distance away, so they've gone offshore, but uh, they're still out there menacing. Uh, Patty, Jane, thank you for, first of all, organizing this event for all of us. And and uh, thank you for the opportunity to serve on this this panel with uh, Frank and Toshi, who, who've done an excellent job setting out the the, the core issues. Uh, I should begin with a disclaimer, make clear that uh, the views I'm representing today are my personal views. Uh, I'm not representing my employer or its sponsors. Uh, Patty Jane asked me two, two questions. Uh, first, uh, what assumptions were made when the program of record was put together in the Obama administration? Well, the, there were uh, intelligence-informed judgments. I, I wouldn't quite call them assumptions, but intelligence-informed political judgments about the nature of the nuclear threat environment at the time and for the eight to 10-year time horizon we were looking at. Uh, and there were four, four, main, four main assessments. The first was that, th that there was and uh, remain, despite a lot of counterterrorism activity, a, a plausible risk of nuclear attack on the United States or an ally or partner by, by a terrorist organization uh, working in collaboration with a proliferator. Uh, and um, we saw that as the most likely pathway to actual nuclear employment on the United States. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we took a, a, a wary but cautiously optimistic view of developments with Russia and China. Uh, in, in general, I think our view backwards in the preceding 10 years was that the uh, optimism that marked major power relations after 9-11 had not been um, achieved. And there, there was a need to, quote, reset the U.S.-Russia relationship, or at least try to. Uh, and within a very short period, it was clear that reset was going to be frustrated uh, and that there was a need to rebalance military capability to the Indo-Pacific. But uh, this, this led to an emphasis on strategic stability rather than deterrence of Russia and China. Uh, the two obviously closely associated, and I'm only making a point about a matter of emphasis. Uh, the third judgment was that the environment was marked by substantial uncertainty and thus there was a need to be well hedged against the possibility of some future nuclear requirement emerging. Uh, and this was a significant and prominent part of the assessment. Uh, so the, the fourth assessment was that 
it was necessary to maintain the triad and to maintain the triad required modernizing the triad uh, and in making this judgment this this followed i mean basically all of these judgments followed the advice of the bipartisan strategic posture commission that reported out in spring of 2009 about the time we were beginning the the obama npr uh, and the sizing of the force was determined by the requirements of strategic stability with Russia and China, and by the requirement to be well hedged against the possibility that New START might not work, and that it would be necessary to reconstitute the sort level, the Moscow Treaty level forces. So the ca capability to do that was maintained. The second question you asked about is, is, is the program of record adequate for projected uh, the projected threat environment. Well, it's important to get the numbers right, uh, but not uh, um, but not to focus solely on the numbers. So let me talk about the rest before the numbers. Uh, as 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 Frank has already argued, uh, well argued, the emergence of a second nuclear peer is going to have far-reaching consequences. Some are simply additive to our requirements for deterrence and, and policy, if you will, but some are also transformative. Uh, and I think when we emphasize force sizing issues, we're missing some of these other transformative implications of the emergence of a second nuclear peer. Frank's talked about one, which is the, the implication for our nuclear employment policy. Are we going to do uh, two at the same time in our employment planning? Are we going to do one after the other? Is one simply lesser included? These are fundamental questions. They're not new questions, but they take on a very different meaning when, China, when the second actor is, is, a, is a peer. Uh, and, and this will invite again, the longstanding debate about is counterforce stabilizing or destabilizing and helpful or unhelpful to our deterrence and employment strategies. A second way in which the two-near peer problem will be transformative is for the practice of extended nuclear deterrence. We currently have two very different approaches, one in Europe, one in Asia. But the two-near peer problem presents us with one problem, the need to deter aggression simultaneously in two regions and to respond in one or two at the same time with assets that are only, frankly, sufficient for one, and one or one and a half. Uh, so we're going to be asking more of allies in a new division of deterrence labor. They're going to be asking more of us on extended nuclear deterrence. Third, force survivability. Uh, achieving sufficient and comfortable strategic warning of attack against one peer is one problem. Against two peers, it's a much harder problem. And this is going to introduce some significant crisis instabilities uh, if we ever come to that moment. Uh, a fourth uh, significant implication is for our hedge strategy. Uh, if, as Frank argues, we should, uh, and Toshi as well, meet the current challenge by uploading some of our reserve warheads, well, we have to reset the hedge somehow. And are we simply going? Are we going to reset it simply by building some more reserve warheads, or are we going to build it by building? Or are we going to reset by finally building the flexible infrastructure we've talked about for a long time? And fifthly, of course, there's an implication for arms control strategy. If arms control with two is already dying, uh, it needs to adapt to three or or die. So back to your core question, is, is the new U.S. nuclear force right size? Well, I want to come back to your question, projected growth. And we have used the terms interchangeably near peer and peer. I think we have two projections, a, a roughly 2026 projection when the three new missile fields will be completed and then the projection out into the middle of the next decade where there's a larger supply of weapons 
but not necessarily a larger force because it depends on what China does after completion of the three missile fields and, and current SSBN construction. So I think we have two questions to address. We have a projected two near peer threat. China won't be a full nuclear peer in 2026. It'll be a nuclear peer in 2036, presumably. Uh, and for 2026, uh, I'm with Frank. Um, the 1550 number was sufficient for the security environment we were in at the time. It was a little excess to requirements, actually. We were disappointed the Russians didn't want to go lower, but they didn't. And so 1550 was the right number for the time. Circumstances have changed a lot. It can't be the right number. Fewer is certainly not the right number in the current circumstance, so more. But as Frank suggested, it need not be necessarily a one-for-one -one mix. They have 360 new. We should have 360 new. It's not, not, that, not that simple. But what about beyond the, the completion of the three missile fields? What more would we need to do at that point? Well, it depends. It depends on what they do. If they put a lot more weapons to sea, we can't target them with more weapons of our own. If they put more weapons into the theater, we need to do something about the imbalance of strategic nuclear, of, I'm sorry, of theater and nuclear capability. So a part of responding to the two peer problem is now making sure we are hedged against those possibilities so that we can, in the light of the choices they make beyond 2026, be ready to preserve our position and perhaps create additional strategic advantage. One, one closing thought. If you agree with all of those things I've argued about the way in which the two near peer problem is transformative for US nuclear strategy and posture, it's gonna push us out of our policy comfort zones all up and down the board. Places that we've been comfortable on a bipartisan basis making uh, nuclear policy. So nuclear modernization, but without any new capability. Um, nu nuclear modernization, but only with arms control. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the list goes on. A bunch of comfort zones, which aren't going to be available to us anymore. And this will be a serious test of our capacity to move on and build political agreement around some new policy and strategy. Uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge in front of us presented by this problem. Thanks, Patty Jane. Awesome, Thank, thanks so much to you both. Those were really great comments and I have so many questions and I hope uh, the audience is submitting their questions as well. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a couple more questions about um, China's strategic breakout, what it means for them. And then I wanna dig more into your recommendations on what we need to do about it. So. Um, and so, Toshi, you touched on this a bit, but I'm wondering, as China expands its nuclear arsenal, what does this mean for a potential conflict in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, in other words, how might a stronger nuclear force impact China's decisions to both uh, start a conflict and then to escalate a conflict? Uh, Frank, I think you mentioned that, too, so I'd, I'd love to hear from, from both of you on this. Sure. Um, maybe I can uh, wrap in uh, my point about potential lessons that Chinese strategists may have learned from the Ukraine war as an entry point to this discussion, which is how might China use or think about its nuclear forces differently uh, based on what it's observed from the war in Ukraine. I think uh, Putin's early nuclear saber rattling uh, certainly was noticed in China. Uh, and that this had made uh, U.S. and allies more cautious, even though it did not deter them from uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, and it's possible that, that in the future that uh, China could do something similar in a crisis over Taiwan uh, to engage in uh, early nuclear threats. Now, this would be in some ways different from the way we've typically imagined uh, China uh, threatening to use uh, force. Uh, which is that we typically think about China making these threats in the middle of a conflict, either because China is losing the war or because it feels that its nuclear arsenal is under threat. But what's interesting is that uh, this idea of China potentially engaging in early nuclear threats based on a larger theater arsenal that, can, that, that would enable it to make tailored threats uh, is actually very much part of the PLA discourse 
Um, they've been talking about this idea of integrated strategic deterrence for quite some time uh, that would involve uh, increasing readiness levels, uh, deploying forces into the field, simulating operational preparations, conducting exercises and, and, and tests. And the doctrinal writing suggests that these steps are, engage, uh, are designed specifically to instill fear, to impose psychological pressure, and to create uncertainty in the minds of China's opponents. The uh, 2020 uh, Science of Military Strategy, which is considered a semi-authoritative uh, document, uh, calls for maneuvering China's nuclear triad uh, to make the opponent, uh, quote, uh, feel the pressure of the coming war, unquote. So I think uh, what these writings suggest is that um, the lessons, quote unquote, lessons that uh, China may have learned could potentially uh, reinforce um, existing uh, doctrinal preferences uh, you know, when it comes to uh, making um, early nuclear threats. So that's one possible avenue by which uh, China could uh, threaten the use of its nuclear weapons in ways that are different from the way we uh, typically envision. I, I think that's an excellent summary. Let me, let me build on it a little bit. I mean, I think that it's very clear that the current force is beyond what is necessary to do minimum deterrence. The question is, what what is it intended to do and how large will it grow to be? And I think a distinction that needs to be made is whatever happens at the doctrinal level, which is generally a, a military staff exercise, even up to senior senior levels, is distinct and different from what happens at the senior political level, at the level of the people who are going to actually authorize the use of, of nuclear weapons. I think where it starts to break down is that um, the Russians have made clear or made clear early on in the, in the Ukraine conflict until very recently that threat, threats are fine. They believe that they've, they've uh, achieved some psychological uh, superiority and have uh, some deterrence over, over the West uh, in what they've been doing. But you've got to be very careful that, that your, your belief in your nuclear diplomacy doesn't spill over into the area of actually deciding to use nuclear weapons. And we've, we have been very clear, we the United States, uh, for decades, um, uh, we recognize we cannot win a nuclear war, and the way we deter is to make certain that enemy leaders understand that they can't win a nuclear war either. Uh, sadly, we have we have buried that kind of language uh, over the past couple of administrations, uh, going back to the beginning of this century. The NPR is interesting. The NPR says if 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 North Korea starts a nuclear war, the regime will not survive. But it doesn't say anything about holding at risk what China and and Russian leaderships value. Um, I think it's been interesting that that Putin, as he gets closer to having to contemplate the use of nuclear weapons, has backed down recently. And I think it's going to be very important that Chinese leadership understands that initiating the use of nuclear weapons will could easily result in a situation that not only destroys the United States, but destroys the Chinese state completely. Um, so there's a question of, of political engagement um, beyond the use of, of simple uh, inflammatory rhetoric. And I think that's something that is, I think this is where one of the things that Brad's pointing to. We need, this is a new problem we're going to have to get our head around in how we deter both uh, Xi and Putin as, as uh, and hopefully sooner rather than later Putin's successor um, as time moves on. Great, thank you both. And I'm wondering, it's, uh, we're talking about um, China's expansion, and I'm wondering how far are they going to go? DOD is estimating that China will have around 1,000 nuclear weapons by the end of the decade. Um, I think, Brad, you kind of alluded to this in your opening remarks. Do you think it's wise to assume that China will stop expanding its nuclear forces when they reach that point? Um, you know, how much do we, what do we need to be preparing for it when it comes to China's expansion? Well, it's not wise for us to make any particular assumptions. It's wise for us to be hedged against the plausible range of outcomes. Um, China, of course, doesn't acknowledge that it's engaged in the buildup uh, and thus has given no explanation. We, we all 
read the tea leaves as best we can. Uh, I, I, uh, I think there's a good logic by which one could conclude that they are striving for parity, roughly defined. You know, we, we've sort of stopped using the word parity and, and instead use strategic equivalence. I think they're interested in strategic equivalence with the United States. But I'm not very confident in that judgment. Uh, President Xi, so um, uh, I think we've done ourselves a disservice over the last couple of decades with our constant question about, is China going to sprint to parity? Well, now that it's sprinting, we sort of assume it's going to parity. Um, but pr uh, I, I'm struck by a, a, a quote Toshi didn't use from President Xi, uh, that he seeks uh, a modern military consistent with China's place at the center of the world stage, comma, in the dominant position. That doesn't sound like parody to me. So I'd like to be hedged against the possibility that it chooses to go to a parody-based relationship. Uh, and, and if it chooses to go beyond that, um, we, we will have a choice about whether we want to go back to the business of producing 35,000 nuclear weapons again. I, I don't think we will. Because I don't think we see that nuclear superiority gives ha, has a meaningful strategic advantage, but uh, that that would be another topic that would be hotly contested in, in this changed security environment. If I could jump on what Brad said, uh, just two very quick points. First, he's absolutely right. I mean, what we need to be able to do is hold at risk what the what the potential enemy leadership values, not not fixate on on numbers, but the only historical example that I can point to this, and no one on this panel uh, uh, doesn't know this, but most, most people don't know it, is in the late 60s, when the U.S. stopped building and deploying strategic nuclear weapons, McNamara famously said that the Soviets would reach parity and stop. Well, the Soviets reached parity and kept on building. Um, so much for predictions. And I think the humility that we have to have remembering that and looking forward is is very important great um so now i do want to get into this topic of uh numbers frank and brad you both said that the 1550 we currently have deployed probably won't be enough to deter russia and china simultaneously um but i'm wondering if you both can elaborate a bit more on on why this is so you know what are why is it that we need more numbers as adversaries grow their own nuclear forces um why can't we just you know, keep the, the force that we have, since some might argue it's it's already a lot, 1,550. So yeah, just, I'm wondering if you could please elaborate on the theory behind this. Do you want me to start, Brad, or do you want to go first? Okay. So, you know, I mean, canonically, you hold at risk what enemy leaders value. And with, with authoritarian dictatorships, um, it's the leadership itself, it's the, it's the security apparatus that keeps them in power, whether it's the People's Armed Militia or the FSB and the Praetorian Guard in Moscow, um, their military forces uh, to include the uh, nuclear conventional and the industrial potential to sustain war. Um, as Brad so, so clearly pointed out, the security situation in 2010, looking at, a, at, at what the Russian leadership valued, has changed because of the growth in Russian military forces. And the, the Chinese uh, military industrial capacity and China's ability, the Xi Jinping's ability to, to run the burgeoning uh, Chinese state has changed as well. So what was what was sufficient back in, in 2010 is insufficient by simple logic, uh, given the growth in Chinese capabilities and indeed in, in some of Russia's capabilities. I'm not looking at any particular number right now, but but I think logically, as long as we are able confidently to hold at risk what Xi and Putin and KJU value, then then we've got enough. Uh, my argument is that 1550 just doesn't give us enough. And and I would add, and uh, had had I gone first, I would have made those points. Um, so let me just add it. Let me just add a, a second perspective rather than uh, restate those points. Uh, and that's that um, uh, there's a political requirement to do something. 
in addition to a military operational requirement. Uh, if President Xi's perception is the classic perception that autocrats have of dem democracies, that we are led by weak people, easily divided, and can be counted upon to uh, shy away from risk and to retreat when our interests are attacked in a careful and not excessive way. If that's his perception, simply sitting on the new start force level while China engages as a buildup re reinforces it. Unhelpfully so. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a, a political requirement to to respond in some fas fashion to, to China's nuclear buildup. Uh, and I'm less interested in the numbers than the fact of, of, of doing something. Uh, some of you may have seen t today the uh, um, the blog post from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, uh, Rod Lyon, writing about the current nuclear posture review and, and arguing that it's too timid, nibbling at the margins of big problems. We don't want our allies thinking that either. Excellent. And, and as a follow-up question, what options do we have to increase the size of our nuclear arsenal? So the short answer is we have the weapons that were downloaded as a part of New START implementation and mm -hmm. added to the reserve of warheads that can be recertified for, for redeployment. And we have the places on the ICBMs and SLBMs from which they were downloaded to do that. Now, as we modernize and replace those forces, uh, those, those hooks, if you will, are going to decline in number, uh, but we do have the capacity for upload. What we don't have is the capacity to build a lot of new things. We are, we are launched into a modernization plan that is a replacement plan. It's not a modernization plan exactly, it's a replacement plan. Uh, and we can add new capacity when we've completed that replacement plan in roughly 2040 or so. And Brad, you point out that um, we're limited in our, our ability to build new nuclear weapons. So I'm wondering, as another option, um, are there changes to our posture that could help us address this challenge maybe in the near term? For example, would returning even a small portion of the air leg of the triad to a higher level of readiness or alert status contribute to enhancing deterrence? Um, Brad or Frank, I, I'd love to hear from you on this. Well, for, putting bombers back on alert is is an extremely expensive, not not necessarily in dollars, but in dollars but in, in logistics and in, in, in on the stress that it puts on the force thing to do. Uh, and I would argue that absent any near-term threat which suggested that uh, uh, an attempted nuclear strike on the United States was imminent, that we wouldn't need to return the bomber force to any sort of alert status. It's something we should hold back um, to try to head off a real crisis if it's coming down the road. And as Brad says, down the road, we can build more B-21s. We can we can stretch out the line on the Columbia class. In the near term, we can open up the tubes on the Ohio boats that were sealed as a result of New START. But putting bombers back on alert is, is a serious step, um, but it's a step that, that I would not think we would want to do in, in normal peacetime uh, operations. I'd agree with that. I just add one point, and that's that the the, um, the modernized air leg has been the the new it has been slow to arrive to the nuclear mission, and we could pull up the timelines of the availability of both the F thirty five nuclear variant and the B twenty one nuclear variant. I mean, they they both have there aren't there aren't really variants per se, but but we could pull forward that timeline. Uh, they, they needn't be doing uh, runway alerts, uh, but it would be an obvious and appropriate response to the current situation and helpful, I think, for signaling Russia as well.
And I think the That's Air Force, I, if I might, just just a very small point, the Air Force in its planning ought to be planning to buy sufficient LRSOs to equip every hook in the bomber force, not just a portion of it. Great. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit in the interest of time. I want to make sure we talk about uh, the important topic of extended deterrence. Um, Toshi, I know you had some thoughts on that. Could you explain for us what are some implications of China's nuclear expansion uh, on the assurances of our allies in the Indo-Pacific? Sure. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to reinforce uh, Frank's earlier point that when we're talking about stresses on extended deterrence, it's not just about China's expanded nuclear arsenal, it's the overall strategic balance. And so it concerns China's uh, conventional military modernization, as well as its expansion of its uh, paramilitary forces. Um, and you have to combine that with the fact that there's a fundamental asymmetry in the balance between a local power like China versus a global power like the United States, where China can throw the weight of all of its material capabilities in its own backyard, whereas the United States as a global power, has global interests, has global missions, and can only devote a fraction of its capabilities within, within that theater. So I think we have to think about that, those asymmetries on top of China's nuclear modernization. Uh, I just wanted to say actually a few words about uh, Chinese views of extended deterrence, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I've actually read up on some of the uh, scholarly literature. They're by no means authoritative, but they're an indicator of the fact that there's growing interest in studying the dynamics of um, extended deterrence. And it's interesting that the consensus view, the going in position, if you will, uh, is that uh, extended deterrence tends to be very fragile. Uh, to them, uh, states that are under the U.S. Um, security umbrella are, are typically inclined to doubt U.S. commitments. Now, whether that's right or wrong, it's, it is very interesting that that seems to be the consensus view. Uh, they frequently point to the uh, Cold War era transatlantic debates following the Soviet deployment of the SS-20s as an example. And so it seems to me that they are acutely aware uh, of the, uh, and, and also quite interested in studying the decoupling fears that prevailed uh, during, during that time period. And I think in that context, it's not surprising that uh, regional states within Asia uh, are concerned and are rearming. Uh, there are now uh, debates about going nuclear, although that's not new but it's becoming more and more normalized. We're seeing shifts in political and public attitudes, particularly in uh, Northeast Asia and South Korea and Japan um, about these matters. Uh, notably, the uh, late uh, former prime minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, had called for, you know, publicly called for nuclear sharing. And in my uh, informal conversations with uh, Japanese um, uh, folks visiting uh, the U.S., uh, they've been talking about revisiting the three non-nuclear principles, which is uh, not possessing, not producing, and not introducing nuclear capabilities to Japan. And there's interesting interest in perhaps revisiting the third one about not introducing nuclear capabilities to Japan. And that just goes to show how uh, feelings and attitudes and sentiments have changed. And I guess the, the one big takeaway for me when it comes to extended deterrence is that as the environment changes, uh, you know, given the shifts in the strategic balance. I think things that were typically thought of, of as unthinkable among our allies about the things that they're not likely or unwilling to do could potentially become thinkable because of the changing circumstances. So I guess my one, you know, my one takeaway from this is that I think we ought to keep an open mind about uh, the realm of the possible as the security environment continues to deteriorate in the Indo-Pacific. Patty Jane, can I jump in? Yes, please jump in. Uh, I, th I think we should keep open minds. I'm with Toshi on that. But uh, we need to be drivers of this agenda. Uh, we, 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 our allies should have their interests and, and be them on doors of, of uh, extended deterrence. But we, we should be pushing solutions to the new, new and emerging challenges to extended deterrence in, in both regions. Uh, and our, our discussions usually emphasize hardware, uh, but but let's let's pause a minute and think about the software side. Uh, and and our allies in Northeast Asia have have insistently asked for at least ten years, longer than that. Uh, why can't they have more NATO-like extended deterrence? Uh, 
And, and part of the reason that this is a prolonged conversation is we, they haven't really understood what NATO-like means. But a part of what NATO-like, but NATO allies have something the East Asian allies do not which is an agreed consultative process for nuclear employment decision-making. Uh, in, in, in our system, the sole authority for the employment of nuclear weapons is the American president. Uh, and, but uh, here in extended deterrence, he would be making a decision about whether or not to employ a nuclear weapon on behalf of the vital interests of an ally. And his choice to act would be critical, his choice to not act would be critical. And in Europe, our allies wanted a seat at the table, got a seat at the table, and it was our interest to have them at the table, because if we ever have to make that action on their behalf, we, we want them to share the responsibility. Our allies in East Asia don't have a table, don't have, uh, we don't have an agreed mechanism for, for this kind of consultation. It would be reassuring to them, and I think it would send a powerful deterrence message to Pyongyang and Beijing. Uh, so I think we should tend to the software side as well as the hardware. Brad, you actually pre preempted the uh, the next question I was going to ask. Uh, we had a we had a great audience question here asking: Is there any scenario in which the U.S. would allow allies in the Indo-Pacific to proliferate? Um, and I was going to add on to that. You know, if the answer is no, what what other options? do we have to strengthen extended deterrence uh, in the Indo-Pacific? And, and you started to, to answer that um, a bit. I, I'm wondering if, if anyone else wants to comment on um, what Brad said or on this question about allowing our allies to proliferate. Hard to, hard to improve on what Brad said. I think he, he hit the nail on the head. And I don't, I don't think that proliferation uh, which presumably means one of three uh, nations, Australia, Japan, or South Korea, will improve strategic stability in the Pacific. Um, as I said earlier, we're, we're dealing with Russia, we're dealing with China, we're dealing with North Korea. Uh, extended deterrence can work, but it can work a lot better in the Pacific than it currently is. And I think Brad's points are, are spot on. That's what we need to be doing. Uh, the other thing is, I had conversations a long time ago with Japanese officials who said, you know, in, in a year we could have a nuclear weapon. And my, my comeback was, that that's right. And, and for, for tens of billions of dollars in 20 years, you could have a nuclear deterrent. In the interim, you've got a, a target for the, for the, for the, for the enemy. Um, nothing will change in the near term for proliferation, except to make things more unsettled. Uh, what Brad has suggested can improve things uh, in the near term, um, but if, if done quickly and, and uh, correctly. Uh, so we have seven minutes left and I have a couple more good audience questions I wanna get to. One is on the, uh, the, the nuclear armed sea launched cruise missile, the Slickham N, uh, which I guess ties into our extended deterrence discussion. Uh, and I'll add a bit here. So we we saw we've known for a while that the Biden administration planned to cancel this program, uh, and then we finally saw the the justifications in the NPR. Uh, it identified Slicka Men as a capability, quote, no longer required to meet our deterrence needs, unquote. Uh, which to me kind of seemed to imply that our deterrence needs have decreased since Slicka Men was proposed in 2018. Uh, and then we also saw that the NPR's central argument for canceling Slick Amen is that it's uh, no longer necessary now that the w W76-2 low-yield uh, missile was deployed. Uh, what are I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on these justifications. Um, Frank, you're, you're nodding over there. What do you, what do you think about uh, the Slick Amen and what the NPR said about it? Well, I think the NPR is 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 facile and dupli duplicitous. Um, We've never said that we need to rely on a single system for nuclear deterrence. And so to say that the slick amend is unnecessary because we've got other ways to do this uh, strikes me as, as, as a pretense and an excuse. And the other thing that the NPR does is it points the W76-2 as the answer to some of our capabilities to deter uh, limited and low yield nuclear use. And I fully support that. And then at the end, uh, the NPR kind of says, well, but that's okay, because we're going to look at whether we really need the 76-2 anyway. Uh, 
So, I mean, I, I think the NPR, once again, is, is muddled and, and confused in, in many of the things that it says. Yeah, I missed that part on uh, saying that we need to look again, look back at the W76-2. It's interesting. Um, Brad, you look like you were about to say something. I share the uh, perception of all the panelists here that there's a, a, a theater nuclear problem. What, what Admiral Richard Stratcom commander has called a deterrence and assurance gap that's been exposed by the strategies for limited nuclear war of our adversaries. Uh, and uh, I look at the, um, uh, the extended deterrence posture, the, the nuclear posture that we have today, and it's the result of decisions made at the immediate end of the Cold War to withdraw all surface weapons from naval forces, to withdraw all US nuclear weapons from East Asia, and to bring home 97% of the weapons from Europe. And then we retired TLAM in, which was kept for, quote, future contingencies. Well, that posture is just out of alignment with the security environment where we've moved into. It's been out of alignment for a while. It's difficult to change. It's politically hugely complicated to change. And in, in the program of record, there are some important tools that will help address the theater problem. LRSO, the, the new bomber, um, the, uh, the W76-2, uh, well, not in the program of record. But um, I, I, I am with Frank again on this, uh, not on all of his characterizations of the NPR perhaps, but um, uh, on, on the need for uh, the Slicka Man. Uh, it, it fills an important, it, 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 it has a, an important role, not the, only, not the only tool, but an important role in addressing that deterrence and assurance gap. And Toshi, I'd love for you to weigh in here. Do you uh, think that Slick Man would have a useful impact on uh, extended deterrence in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I mean, I would only say that it was interesting that in my, you know, uh, informal conversations with um, Japanese interlocutors, that question kept coming up. Why? Um, so I think there is an impact on, you know, the, the kinds of decisions we make on these things will have a direct impact on how our allies perceive our extended deterrence. Great. So we have time for one more question. Uh, I want to ask about uh, arms racing. Um, Frank, I was, you in your opening remarks, I think you said the idea that uh, we're starting an arms race is embarrassing. So I'd, I'd love to ask you a bit more on this. Um, you know, if we do take steps to strengthen our deterrence by increasing the size of our nuclear arsenal, uh, will that, you know, start or flame an arms race? Uh, and Toshi, I'd love to hear from you too. You mentioned that part of China's nuclear expansion was uh, in response to um, things the U.S. was doing, like missile defense and conventional prompt strike, but it was mostly on uh, based on China's own ambitions. How, how would China react to a, a U.S. nuclear buildup? Um, yeah, love to hear from you, so you let Frank. Me very, brief. Uh, very brief so that my colleagues can, can jump in. One, you know, we're in this ridiculous position where we went on a holiday starting in the, in the late uh, 1990s and did not put new systems into the field and Russia and China did and now as we try to modernize our force and replace aging systems we're being accused of arms racing and the same thing applies to to trying to re to put new conventional prompt strike systems uh, into the field that Russia and China already have but yet the onus is on us according to some that that we're starting an arms race and that's just you know that we tried to lead by example. It didn't work. We now have to redress the situation. The second thing, uh, perhaps more controversial, is that, in my judgment, nuclear deterrence is the bedrock of strategic stability. Arms control can help. It can augment nuclear deterrence. It cannot replace it. There's a school of thought that says arms control is more important than strategic stability. I don't, I don't subscribe to that, obviously. But let me stop and, and, and yield to my colleagues.
Yeah, let me just say very briefly that I think it's important that, you know, to note that, you know, China is not only responding to our initiatives, right? China has its own agency. And it's also worth considering the possibility that much of the Chinese discourse about its vulnerabilities are actually specifically designed to constrain our actions. Brian, you want the final brief, word? Well, thank you. Um, just a, a, br a brief word about um, um, there, there are many aspects of arms arms racing that that would be damaging to the interests of the United States and its allies. But but let's also recognize if an arms race does begin and is needed, uh, there it's it's uh, cheaper than fighting a war as a way to signal our resolve to defend our interests. Uh, and um, if it's the case that President President Putin or Chairman Xi launch into a a dramatic buildup, a, a push to supremacy, because they believe that supremacy can be turned into an advantage that they can press in conflict to produce our retreat from our interests, then we have to disabuse them of that notion. And we're not going to do it with preemptive war. So we're going to do it with a competitive response to their force developments. And I, I very much hope we don't go there. Uh, and we're certainly not the initiators of, of the race uh, if, uh, to the extent one's begun. But I do think we have to recognize that the alternative in the circumstance they might create is, is war. Great. Well, I wish we had another hour to talk about this. Uh, this has been a really great discussion, um, but we're we're at the end of our event time. So, so thank you so much to the three of you for joining us. Uh, your analysis has been really, really useful. Uh, and thanks to the audience for tuning in. Um, we'll also be able to share, I think, a podcast and a YouTube video of the event uh, in a couple of days. So thank you all again, and we're going to uh, wrap up here.